what just happened? It's over, but not. I mean, the only proof the event happened at all is the mess it created. One moment it was peaceful and quiet, and then all of a sudden, chaos. And you think I'm talking about that pandemic. I am not. I'm talking about Christmas morning between the hours of 5.30 and 7.30 a.m. But it does feel like 2020, in a way. I mean, here we are, the Sunday between Christmas and New Year's, and you don't need your dad's pocket knife to open up all the emotions that were packaged into this year. And the aftermath can feel a little overwhelming. But the only thing to do after the flurry of craziness is to pick up the pieces one piece at a time. This morning, mm, it's been out all night. Uh, this morning, we're, we're going to wrap up 2020 by looking back and peeking forward. I'm gonna invite you to consider three things this morning. Throughout our service, I want you to focus on three gifts. Something you lost in 2020, something you gained, and something you hope to give in 2021. Christmas 2020 was different. Smaller gatherings and mall Santas behind glass, which maybe we should have been doing all along. But it made me long for the Christmas memories I remember. Eating Christmas dinner at my grandmother's house, going to movies with my family on Christmas night. You remember movie theaters? Now, those were simpler days. Days when the Arby's five for five deal meant that five roast beef sandwiches actually cost $5. But how you remember 2020 and, and how you got through it, that's up to you, no matter what happened. We all changed our routines this year, and here's the CH Kids crew with an encouragement to see the bright side of the year that was canceled. It's really weird having to decorate Christmas cookies, wearing masks, and gloves. Yeah, good old 2020. It's okay, at least we still get to do it. Decorating Christmas cookies is one of my favorite traditions. What kind of holiday traditions did you guys not get to do this year? We normally do a big family gathering at Thanksgiving, but I missed that this year. Yeah, me too. We normally do a big cookout on the 4th of July. Our family didn't get to do the Easter egg race this year. Those things, I know, they're crazy, but I love them. <laughs> it makes me kind of sad we didn't get to do it this year. Pandemic. Miss Renee, if you want an egg race, we'll get you an egg race. We can still do that, right guys? Yeah, totally. A socially distanced egg race. Oh man, you guys, it's cold outside. It's okay, we'll bundle up. It could be a winter egg race. Oh, I'm not good at egg races, but you guys can do it. Oh, come on, Miss Anne, you can do it. We'll cheer you on. Do it for Miss Renee. Yeah, come on, Anne. Yeah. Come on, Anne. Anne, 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 one condition, we work with kids, right? Yeah. yeah. If we're gonna do this, we're gonna do it Fortnite style.
view, which means to view or look at the world through what the Bible has to say. I was dropping eggs and they were cracking and splattering everywhere, but then I put an egg into some unpleasant boiling hot water, but it made it stronger. Sure, the egg still fell and it cracked, but it wasn't destroyed. And that reminds me of what Paul has to say in 2 Corinthians 4, when he talks about hard times. He says that we are pressed on all sides, but not crushed. We are confused, but not in despair. And we feel abandoned, but we're not destroyed. Why would someone have hope in hard times? Because of Jesus. Jesus himself said in John 16, that in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. We have hope through Jesus. We are guaranteed to have hard times and disappointments. It's part of living in a sinful, broken world. But as disciples and followers of Jesus, we are also guaranteed that he will offer us his strength and his peace. And we can take heart or be encouraged because no matter what we go through, no matter what we face in life, Jesus has overcome it. You know what that makes me want to do? It makes me want to dance! Okay, but on one condition, we have to do it Fortnite style! Jesus wasn't lying when he told us that we'd have struggles, but he gave us his presence, which makes it all worth it. And these struggles, these disappointments, they can destroy us or they can lead us to new life, new ways of doing things. I call it the fifth drive through lane at Chick-fil-A principle. When indoor dining is shut down, just annex the northbound lane of range line and turn lemons into eight count nuggets. Now, we're not gathering in person today, but that doesn't mean you can't do some things to make it feel like church. For instance, feel free to slap a barcode on your kid's back and just send them down some random hallway. She'll be fine. We'll take communion later, so now's a good time to get your supplies ready. And if you've been with us in person in the last few months, I know you're gonna miss the COVID-proof pre-packaged communion. But here are three easy steps to ensure your communion bread tastes the same at home. Step one, get a sheet of printer paper. Step two, eat it. There are only two steps. Christmas cookies are totally acceptable. Eggnog is not. I'd like to invite you to be a part of the offering this morning. It's not too late to give to one less gift and we wanna make sure we reach our $100,000 goal so that we can give grants to all the amazing projects that were part of this year's catalog. You can give to one less gift by going to chjoplin.org donate and by selecting one less gift in the drop down menu. Thanks in advance for contributing to this special compassion project that will literally help people in our community and all over the world. You can give your regular offering or contribute any year-end gifts online or through the mail. Keep this in mind, year-end giving must be postmarked on or before December 31st, as the church offices will be closed from December 25th, 2020 through January 3rd, 2021. We shift gears this morning and we have a chance to hear from Titus Newens Wander, who has a message for us on what it means to wrap up 2020 well. Christmas just didn't quite sound the same this year, did it? There were no choirs in the lofts, little sounds of jubilation coming from the church walls. It was kind of quiet, still. It's as if God was silent and had nothing to say. Church was empty. Maybe if we listen close enough, we'll discover a song in the silence, a song that started long ago, one that is accompanied by and understood through a story. A story like the one about the priest named Zachariah. You see, for 400 years, God was silent. No prophet came and no scriptures were written. So how was the cosmic silence broken? The receiver of the message was an audience of one, an old, righteous, and childless priest named Zechariah. And it so happened that his name was randomly drawn to burn the incense in the holy place of the temple of God. The privilege was so honored that a priest could only complete the task once in his lifetime. Literally, 
Zechariah had waited his entire life to complete this act of worship. So he enters the temple, sets aflame the incense, and as the smoke begins to rise, prays on behalf of all the people of Israel. It was incredibly sacred. In fact, Zechariah would have mindfully treated it as if he was entering the very presence of his perfectly holy and unfathomably powerful God. I imagine his hands were trembling and his voice quivering as he prayed. As he finishes, he raises his head and there an angel stands in the holy place of the temple, ready to reveal a message that has only been whispered in the heavens. Luke does not describe what an angel looked like, but whatever Zechariah saw, he knew he was gazing at a messenger of God. He gasped in terror, perhaps stumbling backwards or even falling to his knees. But the angel doesn't leave him in suspense, but speaks good news, saying, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. What prayer? The original language that the gospel writer uses points to the prayer that Zechariah just prayed when he was standing at the altar of incense. The one time in his life that he lifts a prayer on behalf of all Israel in the presence of God. What does he pray? What might you pray right now if you were offering a prayer on behalf of all people? What does the people of Israel most need? What do you most need? As in the days of old, Israel desperately needed salvation, hope, and the promised Messiah to come. The angel's good news continues so that Zechariah knows that the prayer he just offered will be fulfilled. The angel announces that God will answer another prayer, one that's probably not been prayed by an old priest for quite some time a prayer that just faded into extinction because all hope had been lost. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son and you are to call him John, which means God is gracious. He will be a joy and delight to you and many will rejoice because of his birth for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born, and he will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah is perplexed, astounded, and in disbelief. Which part of the message does he respond to? A son? A child born to him that will be a changer of hearts? God is going to turn Israel's hearts back to him? Fathers and mothers will turn their hearts to their children and their children to their parents? The willfully rebellious will turn to the righteous? And this prophet to come will prepare people for the coming of the Lord? In the short moments after the angel speaks, I wonder what tidal wave of thoughts must have come crashing over his mind. Surely his priestly teaching must have picked up on the echoes of the ancient prophets. I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple and the messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. The message overwhelms him, and it is more than he can comprehend. Zechariah blurts out, how can this be true? I'm an old geezer and my wife is not far behind me. But Gabriel reminds Zechariah that he is speaking to an angel and that his very presence is proof that God will do this. But since he asked for a sign, he will get it. Zechariah, he says. You will live in silence until the day this takes place. And immediately his hearing is deafened and his tongue muted. So Zechariah returns home. His wife, Elizabeth, does become pregnant. But for over nine months and maybe even longer, Zechariah hears and speaks nothing. He lives in the presence of people, yet always remains alone. 
His only means of communication is by a laborious game of charades or a simple wooden board coated in wax to write a few words down at a time. It's like living in an invisible cell with all his thoughts serving as his cellmates. What would you do? Silence forces us to go to places we often don't afford ourselves to go, making us wade into even our darkest thoughts and feelings. Let me ask, when everything shut down, when many of our jobs were halted, our plans postponed, our sporting events and our movies were all canceled, did you do any thinking? Did you make any changes or struggle with being where you are or even who you are? Silence has a way of shouting and forces us to listen. Well, Zachariah and Elizabeth have a miraculous baby boy, just as Gabriel pronounced. And as was the Jewish custom, they prepared for the covenant of circumcision on the baby's eighth day. Family and friends came to celebrate and all assumed the child would be named little Zachariah Jr. But Elizabeth protests and tell them that he should be named John. And Zachariah confirms this, taking out his tablet and writing, his name is John. And it's at that very moment that his tongue is freed and his ears are opened. And you know what he does to break the nine months of silence? He starts to sing a song. Surely it's a song formed in Zechariah's silence. As he remembered the words of the Psalms and prophets, as he reflected on God's faithful leading of the people of Israel, and as God was now on the cusp of finally, finally bringing salvation to Israel and the entire world through the Messiah. It was in the silence that Zechariah reflected upon the decades of unanswered prayers for a child, the waiting, the wrestling, but it is in the song that he recites the angel's promises about his son. I believe it is often in our silence that the best songs of our hearts are written, even if we are not yet able to sing them. Fourteen years ago, on August 8, 2006, our infant son Tyler took his final breath. He had an unknown genetic disorder that would not allow him to grow. It was the greatest grief Leslie and I have ever experienced. Many of you also understand and know grief's bottomless depths. We were literally torn apart that day, for we had always what for what we had always believed about God to be true felt untrue in the pain. What we thought was for sure in our faith became disconnected by despair. God seemed silent to our prayers, and we came to church often feeling numb and indifferent. Then one day, Leslie just stopped singing. The worship, the praises, and the promises felt insincere. Sunday after Sunday, her voice was silent. And when I occasionally glanced over at her during church, I only saw tears. But slowly and gradually, healing began to come. It came through others who had lost a child. It came through a church family that gave Leslie the time and space needed to mend the heart. And it came most assuredly by a God who held fast taking on our verbal barrage of anger and brokenness and refusing to leave us even when we didn't feel like having him around. Then one Sunday, out of the silence, it came. It was soft, but steady and sure. Leslie was singing, joining in the voices of worship Praise sprang forth, emerging out of the silence like light piercing through the darkness. Now I couldn't sing or speak, and I just listened and gulped back the sobs. God's 
gentleness drew us in. His faithfulness proved true and his grace proved sufficient once again. His love for the broken and his compassion for our unspoken rebellion overcame us. God re-won our hearts. So when Zechariah sings, it is of God's greatest work to come. He sings the gospel story. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. God has come. He has seen us and will act. God has spoken and his promise will be fulfilled. So, what can we learn from this story and this song? In the midst of your trials and suffering, God's redemption is the firm foundation on which we stand. It is the unshakable truth that fends off the lies that God is indifferent. It stands as a proclamation that a rebellious and disobedient heart is offered the forgiveness of sins. God, through Jesus, provided our greatest need and highest one. It is the anchor that keeps us from drifting in torrential waters. It is the constant, even if everything else should crumble around us. It is the mountain on which we stand when destruction and death flood our world. It is the source of hope that all circumstances are redeemable and all people are reachable. The gospel is the never-ending song of a people that have been saved by God, even on the days we are simply unable to sing it. Let us remember, a song comes out of silence that God is not absent from, but present in. For no matter how dark things appear to be, no matter what pandemic envelops our world, He is the never-changing, ever-faithful rock and guide. For all that 2020 has taken from us, we must remember that God has given the greatest gift we could ever receive, Himself. And that is a reason to sing.
light to the world the lord is come let earth receive her king let every heart prepare him heaven nature sing and heaven nature sing and heaven We're going to take communion together. Before we do, I want to give you some time to reflect or discuss the three things I mentioned at the top of our time together. A timer will come up on screen, and as it counts down, I invite you to reflect on these three gifts. What is one thing you lost in 2020? What is one thing you gained? And what is one thing you want to give to others in 2021?
Three gifts we all receive. And they're each important, but only because they each culminate in communion. Everything we've ever lost was nailed to the cross, ensuring that the worst thing is never the last thing. 2020 had Sundays too, you know. And everything we've gained, every good and perfect gift comes from an empty tomb. It comes from a God who coined the word Emmanuel. And the command that the angels gave the shepherds was the same command Jesus gave his disciples. Have peace, because God is with us, tucked in a manger through a baby and tucked into our chest through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And God's economy, I don't know how it works, but even when we lose, we gain. And everything, including 2020, is being made new. 
And so, communion. Together, even when we're apart. And on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, eat, this is my body, do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup. And after giving thanks, he said, drink this cup, for it is a new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. You ready? Let's go. Well, we made it. Uh, not through 2020, we've still got a few days to go there, but I mean, through church. And so for all the three to 10 year olds in the room, I want you to know you're done. You can get up, you can go about your business. I don't care what anybody says to you, you are free to go. But now a word for the adults. There's gonna be a lot of talk this week about how terrible 2020 was and how it's really just a garbage year, but don't get caught up in the hate. Remember that 2020 counts. You don't get a do-over. If you turn 30 in 2021, you're still gonna turn 30 in 2021. The last 365 days, they were yours. My encouragement to you as you look at the next few days of 2020, the last few days of 2020, is to look back and, and look for the good that was tucked into the corners of a really hard year. And I know that there had to have been some joy, there had to have been some good over the last 365 days. Cling to those moments, and may they somehow propel you into 2021. But for now, that's a wrap.